Cami Maddox from the James Cancer Hospital, and I'm accompanied today by Dr. Pierluigi Percou from Sydney Kimmel Cancer Center, Dr. Pamela Allen from Winship Cancer Center, and Dr. Jonathan Friedberg from Wilmot Cancer Center. And we're here today to have a discussion on the treatment landscape in diffuse large B-cell lymphoma and follicular lymphoma. Let's move on and discuss combination therapies. And I'd like to start again in large cell, um, but I'll ask two things about combination therapies. Is there any data or any combinations you've seen that look promising? And then my follow-up would be, what combinations would you like to see or do you think have promise? For the frontline setting or for yeah. the relapse? Let's start with relapse. <laughs> I think there are a number of attempts to combine um, the bispecific antibodies with other agents. Um, and some of these are opportune, uh, and some of them may be rational combinations. But given our experience with rituximab, uh, where you kind of combine rituximab with anything and there's some type of synergy, there's reason to think that um, that could happen again in the bispecific space. Obviously, randomized trials will be needed, but some of these pilots combining you know, novel agents like mosinituzumab with polituzumab mm -hmm. look very, very uh, attractive and uh, tolerable. So, and it feels like that's a, a drug class that you're gonna be able to easily build uh, combinations. So to me, those are some of the more exciting directions in, in the relapse setting. Along the same lines, a uh, combination with uh, polituzumab, for example, and say TEFA, you know, uh, that's another way to look at, you know, a com combining. Um, and, uh, and then you know, at some point, whether we're going to be able to figure out how to combine the uh, uh, BH3 mimetics, you know, venetoclax and that class of drug uh, in, in, the, in, in the management of relapse refractory, you know, the DLBCL probably some subsets of it. Um, with the BTK inhibitors, right? I think that is gonna to have to be, uh, I think that still remains open. Uh, it's just we haven't quite figured out how, how, what patient population to, to select yet. And the, of course, multi-agent chemotherapy, you know, with polituzumab is still not to be forgotten for, for patients that, you know, have typically, you know, relapsed, uh, you know, after more than a year. I think when we look at combinations, you know, we have these active agents, they don't have, you know, some don't have overlapping toxicity and it's interesting or exciting to think about combining them. But what do you guys view as some of the challenges in designing trials with combination or with just combining some of these agents? Any thoughts? Sometimes it's just the trial design itself that when you're trying to figure out how to escalate one or both agents right. and how to do it safely, um, that uh, we still tend to kind of fall into the like typical kind of three plus three design or and you try and do one and then the other and then it requires too many patients. So I think like doing novel um, designs to allow you to try and find not necessarily the dose limiting toxicity but the, you know, the lowest effective dose I think is interesting. When I, I mean, when I think about studies looking at combinations, um, I, I like to, uh, I like to look at studies that enroll multiple different types of, of, of lymphomas. Because I think that it's very difficult, you know, just before getting started to, to, to really figure out whether one particular selected subset. So, you know, in, in, B, in B cell lymphomas or other lymphomas, uh, you know, having mul either multiple cohorts, for example, that really kind of give you the opportunity to explore signals of, you know, efficacy um, and then expand them. I think that, you know, I like, I like those studies. I do think another challenge uh, is that the patients now are being treated every which way. So when you have a study in relapse disease, you know, let's just say that um, it could work well in a polituzumab refractory patient, but not in a patient who's had tafacitumab before, you know, just hypothetically. Because people have different ways that they're treating patients in second line and third line, um, you end up with a very heterogeneous patient population. Um, and the number of lines of therapy may not be a good surrogate for you know, who's likely to be resistant or refractory. So I think in a very thoughtful way, you have to have some biologic rationale on either a subset of patients that are going to benefit from a specific combination regimen. Or like I was saying earlier, you know, if you're targeting CD19 with something, you probably don't want them to be refractory to previous CD19 targeted therapy. 
And I suspect that as we design trials, that's going to become more and more of a barrier mm -hmm. because you're going to have patients that come in that have seen this and that and trying to figure out which study is appropriate for them may become a challenge. Yeah, yeah. the selection, right, you know, and you know, eligibility, that's going to be yeah, because and if they've had one of the agents, right. and yeah. then did they respond or not respond? Because maybe they can still get more of something if they got. The full I mean, another is, another issue in DLBCL is the the question of you know refractory disease. What does it mean exactly, right? I mean, it it is like uh, you know less than you know relapse within twelve months or relapse within six months or exactly failure to achieve you know a response at the end of therapy. There's not a uh, there's not a standardized, I think, way to, 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 to define that at the moment. And in designing the trials or interpreting the, tri the ongoing trials that include some of those populations defined as pro you know, primary refractory, then it's, it's uh, difficult, makes it difficult. I think that's one of the reasons why CAR T cell therapy was both so exciting but also so successful uh, in that those trials were relatively inclusive. Um, and as it turned out, even the very heavily pretreated patients or the most refractory patients seem to have a relatively equal chance of right. responding to CAR T cell therapy as the patients who were a little bit less heavily treated or a little more responsive in the past. Yeah. Um, it, it's unclear whether our new combinations are going to hit that bar or not, but it, it's, we probably could learn a lesson from that. Yeah. And, and oftentimes, especially with combining novel agents, it's hard to know <laughs> if there's actually additional benefit from adding that second agent um, that's mm -hmm. you know, much above and beyond you know, single agent therapy in, a, in just a phase two or phase one study. Any frontline combinations in large cell that you think are? I mean, in addition to the polituzumab that we discussed extensively before, there are a couple of other phase three trials. Uh, again, trying mm -hmm. to look at a BTK inhibitor combination in subsets of patients. Um, people are looking at uh, Tafalen, right. with or without RCHOP. Uh, you know, it's hard to know how those studies are going to turn out, but I think given the result that we saw with polituzumab, we might be optimistic that one of those w will become positive and maybe ultimately create new standards. I think the uh, planned and, and uh, some of them are beginning to be underway trials that are trying to incorporate the bispecifics are maybe the most exciting. And do you think frontline trials should start using POLA as the standard arm instead of our chop? <laughs> Question. I will say that we we have started actually using um, polituzumab frontline for our high risk patients, but I don't know if you think about the Hodgkin experience. There was also a lot of controversy in terms of brentuximab AVD being the comparator for a trial, and a lot of people didn't feel like that was warranted. But now I think everyone's pretty glad <laughs> that that was the decision. So you know, I I. I, I I think it's tough because this is, you know, the way that the trial was designed was for higher risk patients. So I guess you'd have to trial, the design of the trial would also have to include that same population. I Me mean, personally, I, I would still like to see, you know, a few additional phase three trials using RCHOP as, as comparator um, because to, to really kind of assess carefully the, the, the additional benefit of the investigational arm. Um, that may not be, you know, a majority opinion, but uh, it's, uh, and I think that um, the, you know, I don't think there would be a, a hesitancy in, in, in investigators, uh, both in academic centers or people who are participating in trials at uh, more community centers to, um, to say that uh, our CHOP is not. Um, the question is, uh, the, the, a good, you know, standard of care. Um, the, the question is whether for some of those subsets of patients that we discussed, people feel very strongly that uh, using uh, our CHOP would be inadequate. So, I mean, to some degree we have the double hit lymphomas uh, experience where I think almost everyone feels, w would feel inappropriate to use uh, our CHOP. Um, and, and I don't know if there is any subset of DLBCLs in the polar ARCHOP trial that any here around the table would feel that, you know, the same way. So, you know, that ARCHOP absolutely is not, uh, what do you think? 
Oh, well, I, I'm probably more with Dr. Allen that uh, if, <laughs> if it gets FDA approval, yeah. um, it feels to me like you know, that's a positive that's direction. It was a study of over 900 patients, a robust randomized trial that demonstrated um, superiority. Yeah. Uh, and it's a regimen, as, as we said earlier, that I don't think will make it more challenging to build upon. Mm -hmm. So for those reasons, I would probably think that the polituzumab containing uh, combination would be a reasonable control arm. Um, but we'll have to see how that evolves, and there may be certain subsets of patients where that's not the case. Yeah. I think there's a chance, I mean, we went a long time without having a positive trial, but now that we've had one, I feel like there's a chance you could see Tapolen, RCHOP, bispecific, you know, RCHOP, and then you might have like a menu, but then yes. you still don't know what's the best one, yeah. and... Uh -huh. That's a nice well, problem to have. <laughs> it is, it is, but then it's like, well, what one should I use in this patient? Um, um, how about follicular lymphoma? Any combinations that you've seen that look really good there or that you'd like to see there? Frontline or relapsed? I mean, I think uh, there are some very early studies that are looking at approaches that use bispecifics up front in follicular lymphoma that, you know, the concept is great, uh, but obviously this is a disease where you need very long follow-up. This is also a disease where our current standard treatment, chemoimmunotherapy, um, does quite well for most patients. So it's a challenge to look at a pilot um, study that looks good with short follow-up and to have any confidence how that's going to be better. I think that brings us to a study like the relevant study where you know the combination of lenalidomide and, and rituximab looked like it might beat chemoimmunotherapy, and it didn't. Um, it, it looked pretty uh, equivalent, though, which you know, in many people still might view as a, as a positive direction for that disease. But I think it speaks to the challenge in this disease when we're not good at picking out the high-risk patients up front, and you have to treat a lot of patients to see relatively few events. Um, it, it's hard, certainly in the upfront setting, to be too excited about big changes in the near future.